All right, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. I love uh, being here to worship with you guys. Um, so thank you for that honor, and I pray that you would be encouraged by um, just uh, Galatians, our passage this morning. Uh, if you would, uh, bow with me in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to you. Uh, we are so thankful that your love uh, just run so deep, deep that you would send your one and only Son uh, to die on the cross on our behalf, and that in him we might be able to find life and forgiveness of sins. God, we, thank, we are thankful for the grief, grace and the peace that you show us through your Son. We pray that we would be able to uh, listen to your word this morning. We pray that you would encourage us. We pray that you would help us to become more like your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. Amen. Imagine if you would, if you were alive during the times of uh, Hitler, Adolf Hitler. I think we are all familiar of just how bad, how terrible of a man Hitler was. Now say his reign of terror ha had already begun. And you knew about everything that he was doing. You knew how he uh, herded Jews into these concentration camps. Uh, and you knew also that uh, at these concentration camps that uh, Jews themselves were being uh, exterminated. That they were being killed. That they were being placed into these gas chambers and whatnot. And that they uh, were dying. And you knew that Hitler's plan was to exterminate all of those that were not of this so-called Aryan race. Now also imagine that after some time, you began to receive word that Hitler was no longer killing Jews, that he was no longer trying to fulfill this plan uh, of creating and building this superior, superior society. But instead, this man Hitler, who was once killing Jews, was now saving them and setting them free. In other words, the one who was so against these Jews had now become one who was so for the Jews. What would you think if you were in that situation? If you were during those times, if you were receiving this word of Hitler changing and making this 180 turn, would you believe such claims as they were coming to you. If you're like me, in your head you're thinking, probably no way. I wouldn't ever believe that because Hitler was so uh, crazy. Hitler was so um, in such a mania that, that you would never believe such a thing. And it seems pretty unbelievable and unlikely if you ask me. Yet, in a similar fashion, uh, perhaps not to the same degree, but in a very similar way, this happened in the life of Paul, formerly Saul. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 24, Paul gives the account of how the revelation of Jesus Christ, of how this gospel changed his life radically. Paul made this 180 turn from becoming a killer of Jews, a persecutor of Jews, to one or, or one who would preach, uh, one who, or a killer of Gentiles, excuse me, to one who would preach and bring the good news of the gospel to these Gentiles, to these people that he once hated. Paul had a radical shift in his life. Uh, I don't know if any of you were there yesterday, perhaps a few of you, but uh, if you did not know, there was a, a big uh, Cantonese outreach uh, at our church um, yesterday. Uh, it was a uh, evangelistic opera, if you will. And I attended, um, and I don't speak or understand really any Cantonese at all. But uh, my dad does, uh, and I wanted to attend uh, for the sake of my parents. My mom also, she is from Taiwan, so she didn't understand anything either. So I was sitting here, my mom was sitting here, and my dad was sitting here. And my dad would translate to my mom, 
And then my mom would then translate to me. And that was the only reason why I knew, you know, at all what was going on at this uh, event as they were talking and sharing their testimony and such. And basically this uh, opera team was a, a, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife couple, a husband and a wife team that came and they sang in their opera voices and uh, it was good. And, and, and a bulk of what they did was just to share their testimony. Uh, they wanted to share how they came to the Lord, how they came to become uh, believers in Christ. And by translation, this is what I got from uh, at least the man's testimony. He uh, describes his life before Christ as being someone very quick-tempered. You know, he got mad very easily, and he showed it. And, and he kind of gave this illustration of when he used to drive on the road. You know, he had... Uh, what you would call road rage. You know, if someone would cut him off, he would chase down those cars, roll down the windows, and yell profanities at them. Uh, perhaps give them a certain finger. Um, yet, when he came to Christ, his, his attitude changed. In this particular instance of his former life, he would chase down cars and yell profanities at them, but when God came into his life, he changed. And as a car might cut him off, he would chase the car down, roll down his window, and say, God bless you to these people who cut him off. This was a man who had his life changed by the grace of God. Because of God's grace, the gospel should make us different. The gospel, if it has truly penetrated your life, should make you different. This morning, we see two things, two main areas. We see the revela revelation and also the conversion. The revelation is basically the proof or the legitimacy of Paul's gospel or more simply, we see the origin of Paul's gospel. And the conversion, we'll see the transforming power of the gospel to turn the sinner into a saint. So first we begin in the revelation, this revelation that Paul received. A look at verses 11 to the first part of verse 12. Uh, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. Verse 11 in Galatians chapter 1, it says this, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. Paul here is likely beginning a defense of his ministry. There were many of those, uh, many opponents of his that were bringing of various charges against Paul. Perhaps some of these charges were them saying that Paul was just a mere convert. He was just like anyone else, just a normal type of Christian. And maybe another accusation that they brought against him was that he was just following orders from the other apostles. He was bound by these other apostles. These apostles, these people, these men, that walked with Jesus. And they also brought charge against him that he was not following what the uh, Jewish laws were saying, what Judaism was all about. You know, he was de-emphasizing uh, this idea uh, of physical circumcision. And he was uh, de-emphasizing this idea, this practice of the keeping of the Old Testament law. So Paul, knowing that these charges were being brought against him, he makes his defense very clear. If you want the translation more in our day, he's saying, let me make this crystal clear to you, this gospel I received. If you remember from last week, in verses 6 to 10, Pastor Matt, he preached on these verses, and the whole title, the whole idea was that there is no other gospel there is one singular gospel. And now here in these verses before us this morning, Paul 
gives the proof or the authentication of such a gospel. And we see first that it was not according to man. If you have the NIV version, I think it says it was not something that man made up. This gospel that Paul was bringing, this gospel that Paul clinged to, was not invented. And it was not devised by man. Now, think if you were to create a a message of salvation, a message of redemption. uh, And just think about what what you would have in your own plan, what you would have in your own story. And you notice in the true gospel of Christ, in the true gospel of God, uh, who is the one at work in this plan of salvation? Look at verses 3 and 4 in Galatians chapter 1. Uh, We saw this a few weeks ago. It says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul does not say, uh, Grace to you and peace from me. Or grace to you and peace from the churches. But he says specifically, grace to you and peace from who? God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he continues, the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father what is emphasized here, who the main actor in this gospel, in this plan, is not man, but it is God Himself. It is Christ who gave Himself for our sins. And all this was according to the will of God the Father. All of this was so that He might rescue us. Not that we would save ourselves, but that He would rescue us. One commentator says it like this, No man would devise a message which gave him no place. This gospel that we receive has far from it any elements of man. It was not invented by man. And the sole actor, the sole emphasis is placed upon God alone. Have confidence in the gospel because it is not a man made message. And we also see that it was not received from man in verse 12. And what Paul is doing here is he is subtly taking a shot at Judaism, which prided itself in oral tradition. What they did, what they uh, practiced was passing down laws from generation to generation. They had, yes, the Old Testament scriptures, Uh, that we also have, but they also had their oral tradition, which they prided themselves in. These were laws, these were traditions that were not written down, but they were spoken of. And to them, these spoken laws, these spoken rules, were as good, if not better, than the written scripture itself. And Paul is saying he did not receive this gospel of grace and peace from mere man like they did in Judaism. And interestingly, he also says in verse 12 that he was neither taught this message. He was neither taught this message. Paul did not teach the gospel to himself. He didn't go and study for himself and try and find God. And neither did someone else come to him, per se, and teach it to him. No one can be educated by themselves into the kingdom of God. Now, this is a Chinese church, and I am Chinese, and I I know how it is at home for most of you. There is a heavy emphasis on academics. There is a heavy emphasis on uh, achieving things, doing things, so that you can add it to your a resume so that you can add it to your college applications to kind of beef it up and make yourself look good so that you can get into a good college. You know, I hear of certain instances where people will start uh, a new club, will get it approved at school, and they'll try and become an officer in their own new club. 
And that looks really good. If you write on your college application, you know, president of the, I don't know, Grace Club, <laughs> you know, whatever. It looks really good when they say, oh, look at this. This guy was a president of this club. They might not know what this club is, but just the fact that you are a president, that says something about you, says something about your perhaps leadership skills and, and whatnot. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do these things uh, because I think they, there is good value in doing this, these things to uh, get into a good college. And, you know, it's good to do these things. But there is a heavy emphasis on them. And, and I want to make the point here that you cannot earn the gospel through academics. Just because you excel in school, just because you excel in academics does not mean that you can uh, earn the gospel yourself. The gospel revelation is never through man's ingenuity or doing. So then how does this gospel come to us? If it is not from man, then how does it come? It comes from God alone. Look at the end of verse 12. Where does Paul receive this gospel? It says, I, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul receives it, this gospel from Jesus Christ. Both the source uh, where this revelation comes from and the content, what this gospel details, Come from God alone. It is not from man, but it is from God. The idea of revelation is literally an uncovering. It is this opening of eyes. If you are a believer, then your eyes were once blind, but now they have been uncovered by God's grace. If you are an unbeliever here this morning, then you are still blind to the Creator of the universe and to the grace and peace secured for those who believe through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Paul received the gospel not because he was such a great student, not because he was such an obedient uh, Jew or, or whatever, but Paul received the gospel simply by the grace of God. It was God who came to him, as we will see later, and God who changed Paul. If we truly experience the grace of God, then our lives have to be different. They have to be different. True revelation will produce wonderful fruit and change. And we get an example of this in the life of Paul. And now we see the second point, the conversion. And this is basically the rest of the verses, verses 13 to 24. And Basically, this conversion is broken down pretty simply as there's before conversion, at conversion, and after conversion. And that's very logical. And, and first, we begin before conversion. We see Paul's previous life in verses 13 and 14. It says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, jealous for my ancestral traditions. Uh, perhaps when you think of Paul, and I know when I think of Paul, I think of a pillar of the faith. I think of a giant man in the faith. And what immediately comes to my mind is I think of, man, this guy, Paul, he was probably the greatest Christian ever in all of history, you know, this guy was the most obedient. This guy was the most bold for Christ. He probably had the most converts to Christ. And this guy was the greatest Christian ever. And I think sometimes we forget that Paul was once a man by the name of Saul. And this man, Saul, was the great persecutor of Christians. Saul was infamous, and this means that he was known in a bad way. And he was known for being merciless in his dealing with Christians. He persecuted the church, it says, beyond measure or to an extraordinary degree. Saul went above and beyond to destroy the church. And he saw the gospel as this 
blasphemous as this dishonoring message uh, of God. Uh, Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 9. And we'll see some of this, of how Paul's attitude was before he came, truly came to Christ. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1, it says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, we right away see Paul's attitude in his breath. He is murmuring threats, and not only threats, but murder against these disciples. Paul wants not only to threaten these so-called Christians, but Paul wants to murder them. He wants to kill them. He wants to destroy them because he sees them as people who are distorting God's message. For Saul, he did not just want to terrorize Christians as a hobby, but this was his life's work. This was his way of life, and this is what he dedicated his life to, to rid the world of all of these Christians. He was a Jew among Jews, and he was a man that was advancing at his craft. If religion was a race, then Saul was far, far ahead. Uh, One of my favorite games uh, growing up was uh, a game, which you probably all know, uh, Super Mario Kart. Uh, And I used to love this game, and as you played this game, the sign of you doing very well is if you lap, you know, the person that you're playing against. And if you are not familiar with that term, basically, you know, you're on a track, you're on a course, and you're going around in this circle. And if you, say, are on lap two, and you pass someone who's on lap one, then that means, man, you're really far ahead because you just lapped the person Uh, that you're playing. Saul was doing just that. He was lapping. He was far ahead of his contemporaries. All of his uh, fellow students, all of his fellow Jews, all of his fellow people who were practicing were far behind Saul. And Saul was far ahead of them. And he was more zealous than all of them, it says, And he was zealous for his ancestral traditions. He was, if you will, a modern day Elijah. If you are familiar with the account of Elijah, Elijah basically came into contact. He came into a a battle with the prophets of Baal. And basically it was one against, I don't know how many prophets there were, 50 or 100 or something uh, where Elijah was severely outnumbered. But Elijah took on these prophets, these false prophets, and he was very zealous for God. And Paul viewed himself as such. He was taking on these false prophets, and he was trying to uh, cleanse and purify uh, what he saw as the true believers of God. Now, have you ever seen someone so passionate about something? Uh, I'm sure you have. Someone who is just so gung-ho, so over the board about uh, a a project or a a cause. And I think our natural thinking is, man, that guy is so enthusiastic. He is so passionate that what he is believing in must be right. You know, because... If it wasn't right, then there's no way he should be this passionate. But what we learn here is that we can be zealously wrong. We can be passionately wrong about something. Mere passion is not the best indicator for uh, rightness or for trueness. Uh, I'm sure when you were all little, you used to believe in Santa Claus. And you probably believe in Santa Claus with a great passion. And every Christmas, you would place your cookies and milk on the table 
believing with all of your little heart that Santa would come down that chimney, Santa would come and eat these cookies and drink the milk, and he would place these presents under your tree, and you believe that with all of your heart. But let me burst your bubble if you believe in Santa Claus still that he is not real. And just because you even now want to really believe in him, it doesn't make it more true. Passion, mere passion, is not an indicator of truthfulness. And this is what we see in Paul. Paul was zealous for what he saw as the truth. But what we see and what we find out later is that he was zealous for something that was not true. And you notice Paul's attitude before he was a believer. It was all about me, me, me. And you see, he says, how I used to persecute the church. And I was the one that tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism. And I was extremely zealous for my traditions. I, I, I. Me, me, me. And this was once all of us as well. Before Christ, before we became uh, believers in Him, we are all about ourselves. And notice the change now in the conversion of Paul. At Paul's conversion, in verses 15 and 17, we see how Paul is called. And we see now where the emphasis is placed. It is placed upon God. Verse 15, But when God, who has set me apart even from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Paul's attitude changes now in these verses as he is in the midst of conversion. And we see Paul's unique calling from God. And there is a definite contrast here with this word. But Paul's previous life was such that he was persecuting Christians. But when God came to Paul, his life would be changed. And it was not Paul who took the first step in accepting the gospel, but it was God who delighted. And it was God who chose Paul, even in his mother's womb, even before Paul was physically born. God had already set him apart and chosen him to be a minister to these Gentiles. Paul was called through God's grace. And on the Damascus road, if you are familiar with how Paul was converted, Paul was blinded by a great light. And this light brought him and sent him to his knees. And it was on his knees that he was brought before the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And Christ said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And on his knees, Paul was made to believe this message that he once thought was so blasphemous. And you'll notice that Paul was not a volunteer, but Paul was called. He was called by the sheer grace of God. It was God who revealed to Paul his son and inwardly transformed him. And what was the purpose? It says in verse 16, so that I might preach Him, so that I might preach Christ among the, Jews, among the Gentiles. Saul, the great persecutor, would become Paul, the great preacher. And this idea of him not consulting with flesh and blood or going to these other apostles was to make the point that Paul received the gospel independently apart from them. Paul didn't need to check his message with these apostles because he knew without a doubt uh, what happened to him. He knew without a doubt that he was an apostle called by Christ Jesus himself. I have some uh, two very good friends, uh, and their names are Dan and Eric. 
And basically, whenever I come across an issue, whenever I need advice about something, I go to these two brothers. I say, I call up Dan, or I call up Eric, or I go to their house or something, and I just tell them what is going on. You know, when I was applying to this church, I, I talked to them about it. You know, I, I was asking for their wisdom. I was seeking their counsel. I was seeking their advice. I was consulting them to help me in this situation. And I always do that with them. For me, I have to do that. And I think it's wise for each of us to do that, to have people that we will consult. And what we have to understand here is that much of what Paul is saying here, what, much of what Paul is bringing before us is uh, it's descriptive rather than prescriptive. And what I mean by that is basically this is unique to Paul. And, and Paul isn't instructing us to do the same necessarily here. Uh, we are called to uh, fellowship with one another. We are called to, uh, in a sense, check ourselves with our brothers and sisters. Uh, and Paul here is in a unique situation. He is in a unique period of time where this message has been uniquely confirmed to him. And he does not need to check with others. But we... Uh, not having perhaps this direct revelation from God. We need to check our message. We need to check ourselves with the word of God itself. Paul knew what he saw and heard, and he did not need confirmation because Christ had come to him. So Paul took private preparation before going full out into his ministry. And we see this throughout Scripture. Moses had this period of time in the desert, right? And David, King David, before he was king, before he would become the greatest of all the kings in Israel, he was a mere shepherd boy. And John the Baptist, he prepared in his preparation, and he was in a hill country. He was eating locusts and honey, and he was like a crazy man, just out in the middle of nowhere. And this is how he prepared the way for the coming of Christ. Even Jesus himself had time to prepare for the ministry. Jesus spent 30 years of his life maturing and growing. And it was really only three years of him actually in his ministry. There is something to be said, I think, about boldness and acting in faith. But how do you prepare for when you are about to enter into ministry? Are you in the Word of God? Are you in constant prayer? Perhaps the better question for us this morning is, how is your relationship with God right now? Is it good or is it non-existent? Do you not have a relationship with God at this moment? Are you too busy with life? Our lives as believers should be different. So how was Paul's life different? Look at verse 18. It says, Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, or Peter, and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James the Lord's brother, now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. It was not until three years after being saved that Paul went to uh, Christianity Central, if you will. He went to Jerusalem. And here he stayed with Cephas, or he stayed with Peter for 15 days. Peter, the great apostle of Jesus Christ. And Oh, what I would give to be just a fly on that wall for those 15 days. And you could imagine just some of the conversations that Peter and Paul had. I'm sure Paul asked Peter all kinds of things about Jesus. You know, what, what happened as they were heading towards Jerusalem? You know, what happened at the Lord's Supper? What happened during all these events? And, and here Paul also met with James, the brother of Christ. And I imagine that Paul also had similar questions for James, perhaps different questions as James was the brother. He probably asked Paul or probably asked James, hey, uh, 
hey, James, what, what was Jesus like growing up? What was Jesus like, you know, with, with his parents, with, with uh, Joseph and Mary? Uh, did Jesus, what kind of games did he like? What kind of things did he like to eat? And I'm sure Paul went crazy during these 15 days just picking Peter's brain and picking James's brain. And I'm sure the opposite was true. I'm sure Peter and James were asking Paul the same types of questions. Hey, Paul, what happened on the road to Damascus? What were you doing in uh, Arabia? You know, what were you doing in Damascus? How did Christ come to you? What was that like to be on your knees? What was that blinding light that was before you? And this was probably a, a beautiful exchange between brothers in Christ. And verse 20 gives us proof that Paul was writing to defend himself. He is saying, I promise to you that I am not lying. I promise to you that what I am saying here is true. And our passage continues. Look at verse 21. It says, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which He once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Not only was Paul unknown to the apostles at large, but he was also unknown in Judea. People only knew Paul as Saul, the enemy. They were probably thinking, as Ananias was thinking, on this road to Damascus, are you sure, Lord? Are you sure this is the same guy? Are you sure that this is who you are calling? Don't you know who he is? Don't you know that he is your enemy and he is against you? These Christians, they did not get to see Paul face to face, but they kept on hearing about this man. They kept on hearing of how he so radically changed. And I'm sure they heard so much about him that they probably felt that they knew him. I have a friend who, whose name, uh, well, we call him uh, Hashi. And a lot of people at this church uh, experienced a, a similar thing. You know, a lot of people somehow were connected to this, my friend Hashi, and, and they kept on hearing about him. And these friends, people at this church, people at FCBC, uh, they never met Hashi, right? They never had a face-to-face -face encounter and said, hey, nice to meet you. My name is, you know, Eugene. Oh, my name is Hashi. They never met him. They were never introduced to him, but they kept hearing stories about Hashi. And I remember someone just kept hearing so many stories about Hashi that they kind of got tired and were like, man, I really need to meet this guy. And this was the situation for these churches, for these Christians. They kept hearing about this man, Paul. They did not see him, but they heard about him so much that it was as if they had already knew him. Paul's transformation was so incredible. It was so miraculous that people began glorifying God because of him. The wolf had become a sheep. The persecutor had become a preacher. The one who had no grace and the one who had no peace had become grace and peace filled. When the revelation of Jesus Christ breaks into our lives, we can never be the same again. Have you ever heard the testimony, or someone say, yeah, I, I, I accepted Jesus into my life at a young age, but my life was not all that different. You know, my life didn't change at all. Yes, I accepted Christ, but I didn't change. Beloved, if that is the case in your life, then you are not a Christian. If you claim to know Christ, but your life has not changed, then you are not a Christian. Is your life the same before Christ as it is after Christ? 
And if that is the case, then you are not a believer in God. You are not a true born again believer. When people look at your life, how do they respond? Do they say, yeah, Eugene, he's pretty much the same as he always was? Or do they say, there's something different about you. Something has changed about you. You are no longer the same person you once were. The gospel, if it truly penetrates our lives, does not keep the status quo, but radically transforms our lives. If I may, let's read one more scripture. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, and we'll close with these verses. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. And these are the words of Christ Himself. Verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Are you different here this morning? And how is your light shining for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's pray.